afternoon. Welcome. Uh, there are faces here that I haven't seen last week. <laughs> you missed the, the ordination last, last week. It was a really wonderful service. I'm time with God's Word and, and a blessing from message from two pastors last week. There are two, two pastors who shared the message last week. For those of you who were absent last week. Okay, so today, um, our plan is to go through another, answer another question in relation to the, the this, this, are, this is one of the seven big questions that people ask. And, and we like to answer the question, um, why does God allow pain and suffering in this world? Or why is there pain and suffering in this world? We'll, we'll try to answer that question. Um, and I realized when I was doing this study, uh, it's very long. It's a very long answer to answer these questions. There's different things that, that I would like to share. So I'm going to break this discussion into two, this message into two parts. We're going to talk only about on one, uh, one point today, then next week we're going to discuss the rest of the points. So, so there, will be, there are three items that I would like to discuss to be able to answer this question, why does God allow pain and suffering in this world? Uh, there are three things, and the last two things we're going to talk about next week. Okay, so today we're gonna we're just gonna answer one question out of the three. So those are the three answers. Why is there pain and suffering in this world? And of course, first we know that we live in a fallen world. That's the first thing we need to understand. We live in a fallen world. I'm gonna explain that. We're gonna spend a lot of time there. Second, we are perfected through suffering. We are being perfected through suffering. Did you know that God or Christ himself commanded you to be perfect in all your ways. The Bible tells us to be perfect as I am perfect. So if Jesus commanded us to be perfect in all our ways, uh, in what we do and how we live our life, it's possible, right? If Jesus gave that command, therefore it's possible. Because why would Jesus give a command that we cannot do and we cannot accomplish? I'm gonna explain that next week. And the third one is we are strong when we are weak. We are strong when we are weak. That's a strange answer, right? How is it that you are strong when you are weak? We'll also answer that next week. So be here next week. And we'll answer that, those two questions. The first question, uh, sorry, sorry, the first uh, state, statement, the first statement, uh, we live in a fallen world, is meant is an answer not to, not to believers, not just to believers, but to everyone, whether Believers in Christ or unbelievers. The, la the last two statement is for believers, specifically for Christians. So, we live in a fallen world. Let's start with this. Why don't we review Genesis? Because to be able to understand why are we in a fallen world, I'm going to explain that a bit later on what does fallen means. Um, to be able to understand, we need to go back to the very first book of the Bible. What's the first book? Genesis, right? And let's do a short review of Genesis. Okay, so, so Genesis gives us the account of the beginnings of, of creation, right? When creation, when God created all these things, everything we see right now. Uh, the, the word Genesis, Genesis itself means origin. Origin. Uh, Genesis talks about the origin of the universe. Uh, talks about the origin of the world, talks about the origin of the human race, talks about the origin of sin and evil. If you want to know where sin came from, where evil came from, how did this world came about, it's all in Genesis. Uh, the origin of nations and languages. Why is it that we have a lot of languages? Filipino, Chinese, Tagalog, Ilocano, right? It, it's... They, they, I'm not sure if Ilocano existed around the time of Genesis. I'm not sure about that, but... But the reason why we have many languages is also from Genesis. You'll find out why we have a lot of languages. Also, the origin of the Jewish nation, uh, Israel, also is also documented in the book of Genesis. So, not too long after Adam and Eve fell into sin, or oh, sorry, was created by God, they fell into sin. So, so after a short period, you know, of course, God after God created Adam and Eve. They were put into a garden, placed into a garden, right? Garden of Eden. But after a 
Not too long after that, they fell into the trap of Satan. Satan tempted them. Uh, and Satan himself was disguised as a serpent. So, so the serpent itself, uh, some people say Satan looks like a serpent, but, but it's just a disguise, right? It's just a disguise. And so, this is what happened after Adam and Eve committed sin. This is what they did. And I want to show you. It's found in Genesis 3, 7 to 10. And I'm going to read it for you. I hope it's clear on the screen. Genesis 3, 7 to 10. So after they committed sin, verse 7, Then the eyes of both Adam and Eve, we're talking about Adam and Eve, of them were open. They realized that they were naked. They were naked. So they realized, oh, what pala ko? Wala akong damit. So they sewed, uh, they sewed, sewed uh, fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. So, you know, pandang sa ilin nila, they covered themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in a garden in the cool of the day. So God went, came down and, and, and walked in the garden. And when they heard God, they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. And God was Adam and Eve. Guilty, you know? <laughs> They were guilty. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? Adam, where are you? Of course, Adam na ng Panginoon yan, di ba? God knew. And he answered, this is what Adam said, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. You know, God has been meeting with Adam probably before this, but Adam never hid. And he said, Adam and Eve, they, they, never, they never hid. But how come this time they hid themselves from God? And they were aware that they were naked. So they realized that they committed something wrong. They disobeyed God. This is the very first time sin came into the world. And they realized they disobeyed God. They hid from God. I don't want to see you, God. I don't want to meet with you. You know, ever since that time, man has been hiding from God. Ever since that time. All, everyone that came out of Adam has been hiding from God. Separated from God. You know, God's plan originally was for us to be in close relationship with Him close relationship but because of sin this relationship was broken it was broken eventually Adam and, Adam and Eve was banished from the garden in verse 23 323 Genesis 323 and they're on their own they were on their own living a life that's independent of God separated from God not just them but everyone that came unto them. Not just them, but all of us, eventually. So, eventually, because of, because of their sin, all the descendants of Adam live a life that's independent, separated from God. So let me ask you this question. It's two questions. Who among you can say that you are constantly obeying God? Who among you can say that you are constantly can you raise your hand and say, oh, I'm consistently obeying God, listening to Him. We're all guilty, right? I myself, I cannot say that fully, that I'm obeying everything that God commands me. Who among you can say that you're constantly living according to God's will? That's the effect of sin. That's the effect of sin. sin. Because... We were meant to be constantly in, in fellowship with God, but, but somehow we're not able to do it now because of sin. Listen to what the Bible say, says about not relying on God. We studied this verse last as Thursday, right? Oh, Wednesday, sorry. My memory is already falling apart. That's Wednesday on our life group. So we studied this in our life group uh, at Eloida's uh, home. So it's found in James. 4, verse 13 to 16. If you have your Bible, you can open this passage as well. 
James 4, verse 13 to 16. And this is what God is saying about people who do not rely on Him, who do, do, who do not depend on Him. James 4, 13. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Verse 14. Why? You don't even know what, to, what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are but a mist that appears for a little while and vanishes. And 16, James is encouraging us. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this and that as it is. You boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. All such boasting is evil. Evil. The passage is talking about a proud person, you know? This person is so proud that he's saying, Oh, tomorrow I will go to this place. I will spend a year there. I will do business. I will make money. It's all, I, I, I will, I will, I will. You know, there's not, if you read that statement there, the very first portion of the passage, it seems there's nothing wrong with that statement, right? Practically, think about it in a practical way. Is there something wrong with that statement? Today or tomorrow we will go and do this, go to the city, spend a year there, do business, make some money. It seems there's nothing wrong there. You know, all of us need to earn, right? <laughs> we need to make money. And we, need to, we need to make decisions, we need to plan, right? There, there's nothing wrong about when we plan, there's nothing wrong about planning and making money. So what's the problem with this person here? What's the problem? You know, this person is assuming in arrogance that he knows what tomorrow's, tom tomorrow brings. He knows what's going to happen tomorrow. He's thinking, oh, I'm going to be okay tomorrow. My future is set. I'll be alive tomorrow. And what the James is saying here, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're about to miss. You're, you don't even know. You know, what, what this passage is saying is that pride and boasting in one's ability to plan and direct his own life or her own life is evil. It is evil. It is sin. If you have pride and you're boasting in your own ability to do it, without even depending on God and trusting Him. It's sin and evil. You, see, you read their last statement, all such boasting is evil. Instead, this is what God wants you to do. This is what He wants you to do here. Instead of being proud about holding your own future, taking control about your own future, what God is saying here, you need to say, if it is God's will, then, we will do this, right? You need to remind you need to remind yourself that your future is in God's hands. It's not in your own hands. It's in God's hands, and you need to remind yourself of that all the time. Lord, if it's your will, then we'll go and do business here. Lord, if it's your will, then we'll make money. Now, you see, people make their own decisions. We go on living without God in our day-to-day -day experience most of the time. Most, especially the unbelieving world, world, those people who don't believe in Christ, don't follow God. Every decision they make is according to their own will and their own desires without recognizing God or listening to God or, or obeying Him. But here's the thing, when something goes wrong, when disaster comes upon their life, what, they, what do they do? They blame God. But God has got nothing to do with their life. And they blame God. A lot of people do that. I do this, I'll go here, I'll do this. Then when something goes wrong and disaster strikes, sickness strikes, they say, but you know, back it. Back it. Why? Can we blame God? 
for the, the wrong things we do or the decisions we make on our own? You know, this is something we need to understand. Uh, I want you to see this. Uh, this is the next things that I'm going to talk about. You know, God's way of guiding us, whether believers or unbelievers, His way of guiding us involves our will. It always involves our will. He does not force us or controls us like puppets. God does not control us like puppets. You need to remember that. He makes known His will to us and He allows us to make a choice. He allows us to make a choice. I mean, I, maybe some of you might be asking, oh, how come you're saying that? It's, there, there is a very good example in the Bible that will show you clearly how God works, especially in how He directs us. For believers, through Christ, you know, when, when we came to Christ, when we became Christians, you know, that, that, that broken relationship with God, it, it, it was restored. It was restored. So now if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Christ, your relationship with God is already restored. You are connected back with God. So you were once hiding, now you came out. You're back out of hiding. And now you are meeting with God, you are connected with God now as a Christian. Okay? So, so the reason why Adam and Eve was hiding, they were hiding, is because of their guilt. Guilt is not. They committed sin. But when Christ died for you, and He paid the price of your sins, He actually removed the guilt from you. That's why as Christians, you don't have guilt. Who, is, who still feel guilty here? If you feel guilty and if you're a Christian, then you need to confess to God that sin. Because God, it's not God's plan for you as Christians to live in guilt. And so, since we don't have guilt, we now have confidence in coming to God. Because guilt, of course, God's way of removing guilt is to forgive our sins. Remove all our sins, right? So now, you now have confidence in coming to God. You are able to hear God, listen to Him, listen to Him, understand His Word, understand the Bible. You have the ability to understand the Holy Spirit when He talks to you. In fact, the Bible tells us in Romans 8, 14, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are Christians. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are believers in Christ. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are saints. So, so Christians, believers, disciples, followers, followers of Christ, saints, children of God, they all mean the same. They all mean the same. So God does not bypass our intellect and will. So when God reveals His will to us, we are given a choice to obey or disobey. And this is this is something like a good illustration for this is is the way we we, we train our kids, right? When when you have a child and you tell your child, oh, not say sorry or say thank you." Do you, I know some of you maybe, Anak, say thank you. You, you, you. you coerce your child to say, say sorry or say thank you. Maybe some of you do that, I'm not sure. But, but what you really want from your child is that you want him to say sorry and thank you out of, own, her, out of, out of her own will and volition, right? I'm sorry, Mama, or I'm sorry, I'm th thank you, Mama. Or thank you, I'm sorry. You want it to come from her, by, from her own decision and will. You don't, you don't want to coerce her or, or force her, right? So, that's the same thing with us. God wants us to, to choose according to our own will and decision. A very good example of this pattern is Jesus himself. God, Jesus wasn't a puppet of God the Father. He wasn't a puppet. God didn't control Jesus and say to Jesus, oh, this is what you're going to do, you have no choice but to do it. No. A very good example is the Garden of Gethsemane. You remember that account in the Garden of Gethsemane? You know, the salty Jesus and he sweat like blood. And, and what did Jesus say in the Garden of Gethsemane in Matthew 26, 39? What did Jesus say there? Going, on, going a little farther, I'm going to read it for you. He fell with his face to the ground and prayed. So Jesus prayed. 
And he said, My father, if it is possible, make this cup be taken from me. In another translation, in NLT, uh, this, I, I like the way the NLT translation, New Living Translation puts this. My father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Panginoon, Father, sana, sana tanggalin mo to. Jesus was asking the Father to remove the cup of suffering. But you know what Jesus eventually said? He chose to submit to the will of his Father instead. Instead of turning away from the cup of suffering, what Jesus did is that, Father, Father in heaven, I want your will to be done, not mine. In the NIV translation, he says, Yet not, not as I will, but as you will. You see, Jesus made a choice. He even struggled. He even struggled. And it's the same thing for you and me. We need to make a choice. Once God reveals His will to you, once you understand His will through His Word, you need to make a choice to obey. You need to make a choice. That's why, that's why we cannot blame God for the negative consequences of our choices. Because some of our choices are motivated by sin. And God Himself, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, 6, God does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. He does not delight in evil, evil but rejoices in the truth. It is a, it's a love chapter. It talks about the character of God. He does not delight in evil. God does not delight in injustice. He does not delight in suffering. He does not delight in bringing evil to us. It's not His desire to do that. God wants people to turn to Him, to draw near to Him. But the thing is, people turn away from Him. Turn away from Him. You know, there is, we know that sin is something that God is willing to forgive if you committed sin and, and you're willing to repent. God is going to forgive you. He's going to forgive you because He promised to forgive you if you repent of your sins. But, but here's what, what you need to remember. Sin always has a consequence. Even if God forgives you, there is still a possibility that you're going to face the consequence of your sin. Sin is like being wounded. If you're a Christian and you committed sin, parang, parang na, na, let's say you, you wounded yourself. Isugatan, parang nasugatan. That's, that's what, that's something, imagine when you, you got hurt. God will forgive you. Yung sugat mo, you will be healed. God will heal it. But there will be scars. And there will still be pain. You will still suffer the consequence of that, of that wound. Right? But God will heal you. And you're going to go to heaven. But there are consequences to our sin. A good example here is David. David was a great king. Right? He is called the, the man after God's own heart. But, uh, and remember, what, what, what was the sin of David? What, what was the biggest sin that David committed? That he's well known for. There were two, th two sins that he committed. First, adultery. Second, murder. He, he, he committed adultery with a woman who is not his wife. And he killed the husband. Grave, diba? And to think that he was a king of Israel, and he was even called the man after God's own heart. But he committed this grave sin. And you know, David eventually, eventually he, he, he repented. He said, Lord, uh, search my heart. Lord, forgive me for a wickedness, Lord. I know what I did was wrong. David repented, and God forgave him. So, okay then, he was forgiven. But still, you know, remember, remember what happened? His first son, the first son that came out of that illicit relationship with Bathsheba, died. 
died. That was the consequence of the sin. So what I'm saying is that even though God forgives us, we cannot go on sinning. For one, God is not glorified. We cannot go on sinning because God cannot use us if we live in sin. But one thing we need to remember also, there's consequence to sin. God forgives you, can forgive you if you truly repent. But yes, there might be a consequence to what you do. So, and this is, I just want to digress a little bit. Because this is something I, I just close to my heart, and, and this is something that of a problem. That's it's an issue that's going on in our society right now. Something related to what happened to David. David, you know, a relate an intimate relationship, just like what David did, that was sin when he committed adultery. Intimate relationships between a man and a woman must only happen within the covenant of marriage. You need to remember that. Outside of marriage, intimate, intimate relationships. I know all of you understand what that means. It's sin outside of marriage. You will not see blessing from God. You will not, and it can destroy your relationship. It can destroy your relationship. It, it not, it, it, it's not done within the context of marriage. And sometimes we ask Lord, how come my marriage is not working? Or not necessarily marriage. It could be your relationship with your boyfriend or girlfriend is not working well. You don't have peace. Maybe you're going too far in that relationship. And sometimes we ask, Lord, bless me. But the thing is, how can God bless us if we're not willing to do what He expects of us in the first place? Because if God wants us to obey Him for the blessing to come. There's always a requirement from God. Seek Him first, and His kingdom, all these things will be added to you. Delight in the Lord, and He will grant the desires of your heart. You know, God expects us. To, to obey Him, to delight in Him, to follow Him, before He is able to bless us. You know, and if you are a woman who's 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 uh, sleeping with a husband, with a man who's not your husband, that husband doesn't belong to you. That man does not belong to you. Even if you love each other as boyfriend and girlfriend or, or lovers, you don't belong to each other. You don't belong to each other. That woman, that man that you are with could belong to someone else in the future. And you're taking that person from that person that is going to belong to in the future. That's why, but if you are committed to God before God in, in marriage, that, that, that is the act where you say, when the Lord tells you that you belong to each other, I'm going to give you to each other. The same thing with a, with a man who's with a woman. The woman doesn't belong to you until you Make a covenant before God. I'm saying this because this is a pro this is something that's happening in our society. And the reason why I'm saying this is that if you're struggling with this, if you're going through this, I don't want you to suffer. I want I don't want you to go through troubles in life where you, where you miss out God's love and blessing. I want God to bless you. I want God to bless you. And and sometimes the sufferings that we're going through is our own doing. And if we can avoid those sufferings in the future, then we should, right? Let's protect ourselves from future pain, from future suffering. And people are hurt because of a lot of divorce that's going to this country. And one of the reasons for that could be that people are married in the eyes of the state probably, but they're not married in the eyes of God. Because you know, married, marriage is really something that God puts together. It's not the state. Even if you get married in the state with, with a license, it's really God that puts people together. Jesus, this is the very words of Jesus. This is the very word of Jesus in Mark 10, 9. I want you to listen carefully to what Jesus is saying here. This is not anyone who's saying here, this is not the state, this is not me. This is Jesus himself in Mark 10, 9. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. And listen to this. Therefore, what God has joined together, 
let no one separate. Who joins together? Is it the United States of America? Is it the state of Texas? Is it the church? Is it all? No. It is God himself. No one else. It is God himself. So, in keeping with the, what I've said about repentance, if you are in this situation, what you can do is come before God and, Lord, I want to make this relationship right. Come before God. I want to make this relationship right. I want to be joined together before you, O oh God. And I want, I want you to be the one to, to join us, to join me. Because God desires to bless you. He desires to bless you. But blessing cannot come when you live in sin. And this is what Galatians says. Uh, Paul in Galatians saying, Galatians 7 to 8. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. So, the one who sows to please his simple nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, the Spirit will reap eternal life. The first point, conclusion of the first point that I'm saying is that, what I'm trying to say is that there is pain and suffering in this world because we are living in a fallen world. And may, man makes choices as a result of sin. Man makes choices as a result of sin, independent of God. Choices as a result of sin reaps destructive consequences. So that's why there's pain and suffering in this world, because our choices are motivated by sin. Not all the time, but sometimes. For some people, probably all the time. That's one thing that... Secondly, I will not spend a lot of time writing the second part, but I would like to understand also the second second point. I know that was really something heavy for some of you, but I pray that God will will give you more understanding in these things. The second thing we need to learn and understand: there is pain and suffering in this world because we live in a decaying world. We live in a, a decaying world. Our world, this world right now, is actually degrading decaying, winding down, and is groaning in pain. Did you know that the world is also suffering? The animals are suffering. All creation is suffering. Even the stars and the moon, they are suffering as well. But let me explain this. Romans 8, 18 to 12. I want to read this to you. Um, got it there? Starting in verse 18. I consider our present suffering are not worth compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from the bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth, childbirth right up to the present time. This is a bit hard to understand for some of us. Let me read it again in NLT and New Living Translation. Who among you has NLT translation? Okay. I think that's what you got yeah. yesterday. <laughs> it's good. So NLT, I think, uh, gives it, makes it more understandable. I'll read this again. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory that will be revealed to us later. So God is saying here, or Paul, of course, the Word of God is telling us, that whatever sufferings we're having right now, it's nothing compared to the goodness and the glory that we're going to experience later on in heaven. But this is what he's saying here. For all creation, verse 19, is waiting eagerly for the future day when God will reveal who is His children really are who his children really are. Against its will, verse 20, all creation was subjected to the curse, to God's curse. Uh, but with eager hope, verse 21, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join with God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. Okay, let's stop there. So you see, creation is subjected to God's curse. 
there's a curse that fell into creation. And, and the, it's not because of what creation did. did. Hindi kasalanan ng creation. It's, it's not the fault of the animals. It's not the fault of the sun, the moon, the stars, the earth. Creation fell into, into curse because of what we have done. Nadamay sila. Nadamay ang mga animals. Nadamay ang buong creation, even the weather, everything. Against its will, God's curse fell on creation. Creation itself is suffering, decaying, including animals, nature, earth, the universe, because of what we have done. Because of what humans have done. And Tom Paul here is talking about a future event where, where God is going to restore creation. It's going to happen in the future. And it's going to happen at the time when God will reveal everyone that belongs to Him. So there will be a time when God will reveal on the day kung sino talaga anak niya, who belongs to Him. And I hope all of us dito sa Christian, Filipino Christian fellowship will be on that side where God say, you belong to me. I pray that day, lahat tayo, nakatayo tayo, nasa side tayo ng Panginoon. Si Rachel, si Tabiko, ganun. Sarap lang, di ba? It's good. I pray that day will come for all of us. But you know, on that day also, creation will be restored. Ayusin ang Panginoon yung creation. It will be restored. And, and you see here in this passage, creation, creation is waiting for that day. It's waiting and groaning in verse uh, 22, for we know all creation has been groaning. Creation is groaning. It's waiting. Parang, kailan? Kailan na yun? Kailan? As if it's giving birth. As in the pains of childbirth right up to this present time. So even today, creation is groaning. Waiting for that moment where they will be restored. Lahat, everything in creation. And this is what is happening with creation right now. Creation is suffering. It's decaying. And, you know, even though the world is so beautiful, I, I, if you agree, I, I'm sure you agree with me, right? We went to Yellowstone a couple of years ago, uh, went to the Grand Tetons, um, Oregon. It's a very nice place. We, went, we visited a couple of places there. Um, Wyoming, I think it's a more. There's a good, there, there are good places there, right? Texas, of course, I haven't seen a lot of mountains in Texas. No mountains, right? Maybe, uh, I know there's some good places down south, Big Bang. I'm sure you agree with me that creation really looks good, right? It's so beautiful. Whenever you see animals, they're so cute, they're so nice, they're so good, good looking. If you have dogs, I'm sure you, you, you love to see your, you love your dogs, right? They're so cute, right? Watching the mountains, looking at the mountains, they're so nice, they're so beautiful. We agree that their creation is beautiful. The stars and everything is so beautiful. But you know, it's, it, it's not as beautiful as when God originally created. What we're actually what we're looking right now already saw a lot of damage. There was so much damage, corruption, disasters, that the world is not as beautiful as what how God initially created this world. You know, this world really went through a flood. And the flood damaged the entire world. So the beauty of our present world is nothing compared to the beauty and perfection of the world that Adam lives. Indeed not. Actually, what we're looking right now is just ruins. All the beauty in this world you're looking right now is just ruins. Parang parang bahay ang natamaan ng, ng, ng flood and, 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 and earthquake this is what the world right now is. This is just ruins. Even though it's beautiful still, it's just ruins. It's already ruins. God destroyed this world with a flood. So imagine how the world looked like before the flood. Imagine how the world looked like when God first created this world. It was so beautiful. There wasn't any desert. What up North Pole and South Pole? There was no ice in the North and South Pole. Everything probably was tropical. <laughs> Desert is also an evidence of that destruction. And so we are 
living in a decaying world. Deserts, earthquakes, floods, hurricanes, natural disasters, these are all symptoms of a decaying world. All the calamities we experience. And so, a lot of the suffering, a lot of the suffering that the world is experiencing right now is just a consequence of a decaying world. Because of what? Because of our sins. We cause this to the world. Tayo yung reason bakit ganito ang mundo natin. It's because of us. Because of our sins. And so, there are things in this world that we might not be able to answer. Bakit? We, we, cannot, we might not be able to answer why. Why is it the Lord, this country was hit by this hurricane? Or why, Lord, this country was hit with this earthquake? Why did 50,000 people die in this earthquake? We cannot answer that question on why. There are circumstances that just happen because we live in a decaying world. That's it. And sometimes, maybe, there are situations, and, and I'm going to say this, that God causes certain situations. There are instances that it's God who's going to initiate those things. And we cannot answer the question why. We will not be able to answer the question why in most cases. So that's the reason why we are suffering in this world, because of this decay. And, and the thing that I want you to understand is that we cannot avoid these things. We cannot avoid floods. We cannot prevent these things from happening, earthquakes. But you know what God wants us to do? In the midst of these sufferings and these, these things, what God wants us to do is to draw near to Him, to be closer to Him. Our response must be to call upon Him, not to blame, not to blame. Because in the first place, we cost this to ourselves. And so, He is not the one to blame. You listen to this passage in Second Chronicles 7. This is my last verse for today. Second Chronicles verse 7. This is what God wants us to do when we face calamities and, and, and crisis in our lives. Second Chronicles 7, verse 13. If I shut down, shut up, shut up the heavens, and there will be no rain. If I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among the people, verse 14, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Is what God wants us to do when we face calamities. He wants us to draw near to Him instead of running away from Him. You know, just like, again, another child and parent exactly example. If your child is sick, if, you're, if you are a child and you're sick, I remember when I was sick, when I was sick, a kid, you know, will you blame your parent? If you're a child and you have flu, you have flu. Will you say to your parents, Mommy, why did you cause this flu upon me? Will you blame your parent? You say, No. What will you do as a child? You will embrace your parents more. You will love your parents more. You will, you will, you will lie down in the arms of your parents and let your parents take care of you and love you and care for you. How much more for God who loves you and cares for you? And He's the only one who can save you. He's the only one who can meet your needs. And He's the one who truly, He's the only one who truly loves you. So in the midst of calamity, instead of blaming Him and running away from Him, just like a child who's sick, love your parent, who is loving your parents more, we need to love God more in the midst of those calamities. It's easy for us to blame God. Because we know, we feel in our heart that He is in control of everything. Yes, He is. Yes, He is. But, but there is what we call sin. It prevents him, sin prevents Him from working through our lives. 
and it also prevents us from knowing him. Parang, parang a barrier ba? That keeps him away and keeps us away. That's why we need to, to go against this instinct of blaming God, of running away from him. Let's, let's fight it, Let, just like Jesus, right? He said, not my will, but yours be done. I don't, Lord, take, Father, take away this cup of suffering. But he said, not my will, but yours be done. This is why we have suffering in this world. <laughs> this is why we have suffering in this world. We'll continue in this next Sunday. You know, the church, our church, is not, it's not, I want to say this. Our church is not a place where I want to make you feel good all the time. This is not a place where you can feel good all the time. In fact, the Bible, there are things in the Bible that's hard, that's difficult. You're going to be hurt. You're going to be challenged. We're not a church where we, we will just to inspire us all the time. Our goal here is to know the truth. Right? Is to know the truth. And the truth sometimes encourages us. But sometimes it might hurt us a bit. But in the end, the purpose of his of this is to glorify God. That your lives will become will glorify God. And that God is able to bless you. Because God has a wonderful purpose for you. And he cannot accomplish those things. And there are things in our lives that hinder him from accomplishing that purpose. You know, it's better for us to be hurt now. It's better for us to feel the pain right now, maybe to be offended sometimes, than to, be, to, than to feel the pain and be offended in hell. Hear that? Jesus even said that, right? It's better for you to lose an eye, to lose a hand, than to burn, than your entire body to burn in hell. Okay na lang yung walang mata, walang kamay. Huwag lang matunta yung buong katawan sa impyan. So it's okay for us to, to, to feel the, the, the weight of the Word of God in our lives. This is good. Just like when you discipline your child. It's a good thing. Because it will bring good in the future. And it's better to feel the pain now than to experience the pain of hell. We don't want to go there. No one wants to go there. None of us is going to go there, okay? None? May I ask uh, our singer, uh, Jennifer, to come forward. She's going to give us a, a, a wonderful song, share to us a wonderful song. But before she sings, I'm going to pray for all of you. And I want you to listen to her song afterwards. Let's pray. Oh, mighty Father, this is, this is a very, um, Lord God, strong message of God, Lord. I just pray, Lord God, that we will choose, Lord, to obey your will, Lord. We will choose to follow you. We will choose, Lord God, to listen to you, Lord God, and not give in, Lord God, to our emotions and instincts sometimes, Lord, to run away from you and to blame you, Lord. But in the midst of our suffering, Lord God, that we will draw near to you, Lord. We'll draw closer to you. We'll love you more, Lord God. We will embrace you, Lord God. We'll cry before you as our loving Father, Lord God. Oh God, because you love us, you care for us, oh God. But your desire for us, oh God, is for our hope, for our future, oh God, not to harm us, oh God. Oh God, but for, for our, for, for, to bless us, so that we will be a blessing to others today. So that we, oh God, will glorify you, will honor you, will please you in our lives, Lord. That your name will be glorified among your people, Lord God, in this world, oh God, through our lives, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, thank you, Lord, that, that you, you've been protecting us. Keep us protected, Lord, from pain and suffering, Lord. Deliver us from evil, O oh God. Deliver us from temptation, Lord. Deliver us from situations, O oh God, where we compromise with sin, O oh God, that might bring us, O oh God, to, 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 to pain and suffering, O oh God. Deliver us, O oh God. Protect us from these things. Protect us and protect our children, Lord. And help us to depend on you, to trust you, and not be arrogant, Lord. Not be boastful and proud of God about what we can do and what we can accomplish, Lord. But we will always recognize you, remember you, God, and recognize, Lord, that you hold our lives, that you, take, that you own our lives, and that you hold our future, Lord God. Lord, 
Thank you, Jesus.